Well, hi everyone. Thank you very much for joining us tonight and welcome to Beautiful Waterwise Plants with Colorado Springs Utilities. My name is Katherine Moravec and I am a Senior Water Conservation Specialist and I will be hosting your webinar tonight. So um, we're going to go ahead and jump right in. So um, here in the Pikes Peak region, it can be challenging to get things to grow, but I will say that if you can dial in smart plant selection, that will make a great landscape. Now there's more to having a great landscape than just choosing great plants. I mean, you need a nice setting and you need to have um, a good irrigation system that uses water wisely, but choosing plants wisely also makes a huge difference. And this is a great example of a landscape where they've done a wonderful job um, selecting plants. Here's another view of a landscape that is just wonderful. You've got some beautiful switchgrass in the background there and some uh, ruby muley and some hummingbird mint. Now, as I go through these uh, photos today, I'm going to be highlighting and labeling most of the plants. So you should be able to get back and determine what is something that you would like to choose for your own landscape. I don't know about you, but I, if you've ever wandered around plant nurseries in the spring, you see, um, a lot of folks that are kind of, you know, not exactly sure what they should be choosing. And sometimes if they haven't done their research for plant selection, they can end up having a landscape that doesn't really um, reflect the image they had in their mind. So I wanna make sure that when you are at the end of this webinar, you will be able to learn exactly which resources can help you find great plants for the Pikes Peak region. Um, also knowing the characteristics of high performing plants can be really helpful because that can help you sort through all the information that um, is coming your way from a wide variety of places, some places not even in Colorado. So knowing what to look for is really helpful. And then <clears throat> I want to make sure that you um, actually get some specific plant recommendations from us um, determined by what we've been able to learn over the years. And then last, learning good sources for buying plants. You know, we have all these recommendations, but where can you actually get these things? So we'll go through that. So a little bit more about me. I'm originally from the Denver area. I got a bachelor's degree in biology from CU Boulder, and then got a uh, master's in horticulture from UC Davis. I've worked in landscaping for over 20 years and have worked at Colorado Springs Utilities for 13 years, specifically on landscape water conservation. So let's first of all talk through what are the resources you can access right now to help you find great plants. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because I know many of you are going to really be wanting to have a good list of plants. But this is important because we can't tell you all the plants that are great today. There's just too many. So giving you the resources to help you find plants that are going to fit for your situation will be a great um, outcome of attending this webinar tonight. So the first thing is um, our demonstration gardens. Colorado Springs Utilities offers two water-wise demonstration gardens. The first one is located at 2855 Mesa Road, 80904, and that's our main demonstration garden that's about two acres in size. And at this garden we feature about 400 different plants. This garden is staffed Monday through Friday, um, from eight to noon and then one to five. And if you come and you, you can usually talk to one of our landscape experts who can help you figure out um, how to choose plants for your yard. So that can be a really helpful resource. We also have another water-wise demonstration garden located um, right in front of the Cottonwood Creek Recreation Center at 3920 Dublin Boulevard. Now this garden is unstaffed and it's quite a bit smaller, but it is a great resource for people on the northeast side of town who are looking for low maintenance plants. So I would encourage you to check out that garden. Um, both of the gardens are free, they're open to the public during daylight hours, and there's no tickets required. So just come on over and, and see what we're offering. Now another resource I'd like to share with you is our website waterwiseplants.org. This is a great resource for finding plants because it has a couple of features to it. Number one, um, it has a find a plant functionality where there's all sorts of filters on the left hand side of the web page and that can really help you find plants quickly that fit your interests and your lifestyle. So this is a giant plant list that we have developed from our demonstration gardens that contains over 400 different plants. 
but really getting you to the right match is what we're all about and that's how the filters can help you. In addition, if you're interested in the specific plant, then you can really drill in and find photos of that plant, usually in different times of year, and then details about how um, its water use, its height, its width, its maintenance, etc. So this is a really great resource to get um, information about specific plants. In addition to this website, we have a landscape photo gallery that can really inspire you and help you um, see what's possible here in the Pikes Peak region. The nice thing about this landscape photo gallery is that it can actually link you to specific plants that you see in those photos. Now we don't have this um, dialed in for every single landscape plant in the photographs, but we do highlight a few key ones that can help you determine what you're looking at. Um, in addition, so let's say you have come to the gardens or you've looked at the website and it just feels too overwhelming. It's just too many options. We do have a short list of water-wise plants that we found do really well throughout the Pikes Peak region. And I have posted a link to this document in the chat, so you should be able to access it there. So these would be our top performers that we've seen do really well throughout a wide variety of the Colorado Springs area. And you can always cross-reference this list with um, the gallery at waterwiseplants.org so you can see the pictures. Now, if you have deer, um, you may want to take a look at our deer resistant waterwise plants list as well. Um, I've posted this one in the chat and that can really help you narrow down which plants are more resistant to deer um, and a few tips to help you um, be more successful with your landscape if you have them visiting your yard frequently. Um, and the last resource I wanted to go over is that we do have um, several different uh, recorded webinars on our website at csu.org uh, where we've really looked at um, what are the plants that are doing really well at a certain time of year at the demonstration garden. So we have a June highlights video, an August highlights video, and a September highlights video. And that can really help you find specific plants that are looking great at a particular time of year. So um, watch those webinars, they're chock full of really great information. And then a few other resources that you may wanna consider. There is the Plant Select Program, which is a plant publicity program that is supported by Colorado State University, Denver Botanic Gardens, and the Green Industries of Colorado. So go to plantselect.org and take a look at their recommendations. Now I will say that not all of their plants are water-wise, but they do have a really good list of water-wise plants that um, are available. And then Colorado State University Extension has a wide variety of resources, um, fact sheets that have names of specific types of plants. So those are other good resources to look at as well. So now let's look at uh, where do you buy plants? You know, uh, let's say you, you have a list that you've really narrowed down, where do you actually get them? Well, the first thing I would suggest is to go ahead and look at our local plant nurseries and garden centers. Um, these are great resources. They typically buy from many regional growers. So plants that are grown in the Rocky Mountain region tend to do better when they're planted outside here. But many of these are owned by local residents in the area, their family owned businesses, and they really do a great job. And when you're there, if they don't have exactly what you're looking for, don't be afraid to ask for specific plants. Oftentimes, um, if they're not as busy as their peak season, they're willing to order in plants if they're available, especially if they know that you're gonna come back and buy them. So um, certainly you can develop a long-term relationship with your local nursery and they can be a great resource for you. Um, another place that you might want to consider buying plants is there are several local nonprofit organizations that have annual plant sales. So organizations like the Horticulture Art Society, Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, and the Colorado Native Plant Society all have annual plant sales. And these can be great places to pick up plants that um, you might not normally find available for sale and to support these great organizations that are wonderful parts of our community. Now, if you can't find what you're looking for at either of these locations, you can certainly access regional plant nurseries and garden center. So there are many options in the Denver area, even on up to Fort Collins and Pueblo. And there are also online options for um, purchasing plants. I am someone who I like to look at the quality of plants that I'm buying. So I typically like to buy plants from our local nurseries and garden centers. 
But if I can't find what I'm looking for, I will look for uh, other sources to get them from. All right, now, um, I don't know about you, but when I go to a nursery or garden center, it is really hard for me to resist the urge to, um, to impulse buy because you see something really beautiful and maybe you didn't think of it before and there it is in the pot and it's just waiting to be picked up. Um, what I would suggest is if you are really investing in a specific landscape renovation, it's a good idea to do your research first and kind of have a plan and make sure you shop that list first. Um, and then if you have extra space or you have extra budget, then you can certainly jump in and get some really cool plants that you might not have even thought of. Um, but really shop your list first and then buy things you didn't plan on buying second. And that will help you create a beautiful landscape in the end. My other tip here is don't focus too much on how the plant looks in the pot today. Many water wise plants are not the most beautiful plants at the nursery, but when they're planted and they have the opportunity to grow and fill in over time, they're fantastic additions. Some of the most beautiful plants at the nursery are the most short lived in the landscape. So really focus on the long term. All right, now let's move on to characteristics of high performing plants. And this is where I'm going to talk about um, what qualities you should be using to select plants to be successful here in the Pikes Peak region, and then give you some very specific examples of plants that fit those characteristics. So the first tip is that you have to choose plants in the Pikes Peak region that can withstand drought, wind and hail, and late snowstorms and early frosts and many, many, many other weather events. So most plants can't withstand all of those, but they can be much more resilient than others. So if you can find plants that are resilient to erratic weather, those are the plants that perform the best over time. We're also looking for plants that come back every spring because if you're going to invest in landscape plants, um, the ones that are perennial, they come back year after year, those are going to be the best investment for most of your landscape. Now, if you choose to have some annuals just to enhance and get a pop of color, that makes a lot of sense. But um, I would suggest focusing on plants that come back every spring. 99% of the plants at the WaterWise Demonstration Gardens come back every year. So you can be guaranteed that they're good investments of your time and money. We also wanna make sure that we choose plants that require less water here in the Pikes Peak region. Because we live in a limited water environment and we occasionally go into outdoor water restrictions, it's a good idea to choose low water plants. That way the plants that you choose are gonna be able to withstand a water shortage or just the um, nature of the limited water supplies that we have. And I'm always looking for plants that provide great ornamental value because I want those plants to be making my home look great, to give it fantastic curb appeal and enhance my property value. So how do you get anything to grow here? I hear that question so many times from people that come from other parts of the country. You know, some people come from the Midwest where there's no irrigation, you don't have to water anything, and the soil is already great. Um, here in Colorado Springs, it's a little bit different. So how do you get things to grow here? It's actually not that hard, and I wanna empower you to, to be able to choose great plants. Just choose the toughest plants that you can find, and I will help you identify some of those. And then you wanna water them regularly. Uh, meaning that um, if you choose a very low water plant, you might only be watering that plant once per month, but it's really important to water that plant consistently over time. A low water plant for us might be as watered as often as once per week, and then a moderate water plant might be watered twice per week. But that's really helpful to, if, once you kind of understand that plant's water needs, um, to give them that water over a period of time because we have such dry extended periods here in the Colorado Springs area. The next tip is to use mulch. So if you're doing a plant bed where you have space in between individual plants, you wanna make sure that you cover that soil with either bark chips, wood chips, gravel, or some sort of material to uh, make a really great rooting environment for your plants and to help prevent any weeds that will be growing in between them. All right, so the first quality that we're looking for in plants in the Pikes Peak region is winter survival. So how do you know if a plant is gonna make it through the winter? 
Well, the first thing you can do is look at the USDA hardiness zone. And every plant that you buy in a nursery typically has that information on the plant tag. So for Colorado Springs, you want to choose plants that are zone five or lower. Um, so five, four, three, and two all work perfectly fine, but um, don't choose plants that are like zone nine, zone 10, especially if you're shopping at a big box store. Many of the plants that they sell are not winter hardy here. So just make sure that you're checking for zone five or lower. If you're in a high elevation area, maybe close to 7,000 feet, you may want to limit yourself to zone four or lower, especially for your trees and shrubs that cost more money. Um, it's certainly fine to experiment with higher zone plants if you're kind of a risk taker, but um, I would certainly make sure that you um, focus on the winter hardy plants first. The other thing that you can do to make sure that you are um, getting plants to, to make it through the winter is to periodically winter water them. For those of you that are from water climates, that sounds like a crazy idea, but here where it gets so dry over the winter and our sprinkler systems are not on typically, it is important, especially for newly planted plants, to go out with a hose and a watering wand and water them to get them to hydrate over the winter. And you'll find you have much better survivability if you water plants for the first two winters or so. After that, if they're a real water-wise plant, you can cut down and, and only water if we have an extended dry period. But one of the reasons we're seeing so much plant death this spring is because it was so dry in the fall and then early in the spring before we got this last snowstorm. All right, so um, let's assume that you're, you've come to the conclusion that you are um, choosing zone five plants or lower. What do you need to think about next? The next thing you need to think about is low water and drought resilience. So most of the plants that I plant in my own landscape are really low water plants. So for me, that's uh, plants that can survive on about one day per week watering. And this dwarf rabbit brush is a really great example. Um, the reason I focus on low water plants is because um, if we get an extended dry period locally, then those plants are more likely to still, still perform really well even though we have dry local conditions. Now, if we have dry local conditions, you can still water with your sprinklers, so that's not as big of a deal. Um, but if we have a water shortage where we go into water restrictions, meaning we're only watering two days a week or less, then it's going to be the low water plants that survive that type of um, water restriction. And I just find that um, you know, it's natural to lose some plants over time, but the more low water uh, plants you choose, the more survivability you'll have over time. Now, a perfect example of a low water plant that I highly recommend is baby blue rabbit brush. This is a very uniform, um, silvery leaved sh uh, shrub that gets to be about two feet tall and wide. And this was bred from our local native rabbit brush. Um, now, most of the year, it looks like a beautiful silvery blue globe, very tidy, very um, low to the ground. But then in late summer in August, it gets covered with yellow flowers. So it is a really, really wonderful plant. The thing that's also really nice about this particular plant is that it's very low maintenance. So all you have to do the whole entire year is just come back and hedge it to about a 12 inch ball early in spring meaning like March. And then you end up with this really uniform um, shrub the following months in the growing season, and it's just a fantastic plant. So certainly one that's low water, drought resilient, and can be a great addition to your yard. Another quality that I'm looking for in plants is something that can survive hail and wind. So in those are two things that we just have here in the Colorado Springs area very often. There was one summer that I was counting how many hailstorms we had at my house and I got to seven and I just stopped counting <laughs> because I thought, you know, this is, this is too much. Um, but anyway, with hail and wind, the trick to getting plants to survive hail and wind is to really choose plants that have small leaves. Um, so here we have Mexican feather grass, which is a beautiful ornamental grass. Um, we have prairie zinnia, which is a the little tiny um, yellow perennial over there in the corner, and then we have lead plant. 
Now all of these plants in this combination have small leaves. So what happens is that if we get a really strong windstorm or we get a hailstorm, um, the hail is much less likely to damage these plants than say um, a large leaf plant that you might find at a nursery. So uh, by adding a lot of small leafed plants into your landscape, um, you can really withstand hailstorms much better. So it's certainly a great tip. Now, let me tell you a little bit about lead plant. It is a native plant that's a shrub um, to the eastern plains of Colorado. So it's perfectly, perfectly adapted to our climate and weather because it naturally grows here. In addition, it has very minimal maintenance. So this shrub will grow up to be about four to five feet tall and wide, and it has this very soft, fuzzy, gray compound leaf that's really beautiful. And then in July, it ends up with these spikes of purple flowers that have orange stamens that are just really, really striking. Now, another quality that we need to look for in our plants are, is heat tolerance. Um, especially as we build more uh, asphalt and concrete and buildings in Colorado Springs, heat tolerance is something that we can really use in our landscapes. So this is a particular plant that is a perfect example of a heat tolerant plant. This is hummingbird mint. Um, and this is a perennial flower that comes back year after year. You can see that it's got small leaves just like the other plants that we've, we've covered. Um, this is a native to the southwestern portion of the United States, um, and it is about two to three feet tall and wide. The leaves are very, very fragrant, and that's why it's got mint in the name. And then when in July and August, when it gets these spikes of orange flowers, it attracts hummingbirds. So that's why it's called hummingbird mint. Very fragrant plant, very beautiful, um, and it's just a perfect, a plant for a very hot, dry location that you might have. Here's an, ex of an example of hummingbird mint in the landscape. You can see it on the left-hand side of the photo. And that is a landscape in the Rockerman area. You can see how they've got that rock wall and a dry stream bed and some boulders and gravel mulch. So you're getting a lot of reflected heat in this particular plant um, landscape. So hummingbird mint is very, very happy there. They've also got Carl Forster feathery grass, which is an ornamental grass that performs very well throughout the Colorado Springs area. You could also maybe choose um, a native ornamental grass like a, a Blonde Ambition Blue Grandma. That could also work really well in this situation. And then they have Russian sage in the background that's giving you that spike of purple. So this is a, just a gorgeous combination in the July-August timeframe when a lot of other plants have stopped blooming in the spring. So something to consider for your own yard. Another quality you might be looking for is deer resistant. Now there's no such thing as a deer proof plant, but deer resistant plants are certainly available. Now you may need to resort to using repellents or excluding deer with fences or other means um, but if you're only relying on choosing deer resistant plants, then think about using ornamental grasses because grasses are not the preferred food source for deer. I mean, they will nibble on them if they get hungry enough, but they really prefer shrubs and perennial flowers. You can also add a lot of silver leafed plants into your landscape. They tend to not like plants that have very fuzzy leaves or, um, or strong scented leaves. So things like artemisia, like rabbit brush, like western sage that have gray fuzzy leaves that have a strong scent, deer tend to um, choose them last as opposed to your beautiful rose bushes which are their first choice um, despite the thorns. All right, another really common deer resistant plant is catmint. Catmint is just a simple perennial flower that um, is blooming right now in May and it, into early June, depending on the weather. It has gray fuzzy leaves with a strong scent, which is why the deer don't like it. And this plant will grow almost everywhere. Now it is attractive to honeybees. Um, so if that's something that you wanna support, this could be a wonderful addition to your landscape. Just to give you a few examples of what it looks like in the landscape, this is catmint right here in this beautiful front yard. You can see that this whole cloud of purple right here is catmint, which is gorgeous. 
And then um, this is another one right over here, which is another um, cat mint as well. And so these are just a great example. Okay, so this is the photograph that I started off with. And I just want to show you that there are lots of really beautiful blooming plants in this landscape. This is up by UCCS. But this one is cat mint right here. Here's another patch of cat mint, another patch of cat mint, and then you're seeing three up above the rock wall. And you can see that just by weaving in those, um, those cat mint plants, it gives you such a pop of color. So um, just think about it. It's one of those plants that is so adaptable, can grow anywhere, and rabbits and deer don't seem to prefer it. So think about the cat mint if you, if you so choose. Um, another plant that I wanted to talk about that is fairly deer resistant is moonshine yarrow. Now, once again, this is a gray leafed plant that's kind of fuzzy. Um, and I like this plant because in July, it produces these lemon yellow clusters of flowers. Um, and then even when it's not in bloom, it's got these really gorgeous fern like leaves that have a, just a gorgeous texture in the landscape. And this plant is super adaptable. It can do well in a plant bed. It can do well in a dry site where it doesn't get much water. Um, it seems to perform really well throughout Colorado Springs. So you can have cat mint that blooms in the earlier part of the year and then add in some moonshine yarrow and that will give you um, some extended color throughout the rest of the summer. So think about how you can kind of stagger the blooms with these deer resistant plants. And then by maybe even adding in some ornamental grasses, that can give you some fall interest that would, could translate into the winter. So if you do have deer, you can do it. You just have to kind of change to a different plant palette and do the best you can with what the deer in your area don't like to eat. Um, okay, so the next thing I wanted to suggest is that it is a good idea to um, focus on low maintenance plants as well. Now, the reason for that is that many of us would like to do other things with our lives than work on our yards. I mean, working on the yard is great, but you wanna make sure that you also can do other things with your summer. So this is a shrub called Apache Plume, which is a really perfect example of a low maintenance plant. These have been at the WaterWise demonstration garden for gosh, as long as I've worked here. So probably another 20 years that these plants have been here. Um, and they have a wild Western shape, but they're really, really fantastic. So in May, right now, they are blooming. So there's this, they're the shrub that has this twisted appearance with really tiny leaves. And then in May into June, they have these rose-like white flowers that honeybees just absolutely love. Now this is one plant that you can plant and water it very infrequently after that. Um, so if you're looking for the extreme water-wise plants, certainly look at things like Apache Plume. In addition, you don't have to do much maintenance on it, except just prune out um, branches that you think are unsightly over time. The nice thing about Apache Plume is that after those flowers fade, um, they do develop these really beautiful soft pink seed heads that last for about a month and then they blow off. Um, but you get really good two months of interest um, for this plant. Okay, and I did get a good question here is, do most of these plants require a drip system or are they good to go once established? I would definitely encourage you to invest in a drip system um, because what I have found is that over time, if you don't water plants, we'll get an extended hot dry period and they'll really start to decline. If you have a drip system and you can water them periodically, then that investment you can really maintain through those periodic dry periods. Um, and then when it's wetter, you may not even run your drip system. But we just don't have consistent enough moisture here to do unirrigated landscapes as much as we would like to do that. It just doesn't seem to work very well. Okay, so another low maintenance plant that I like to highlight for you is called Panchito Manzanita. This is one of very few broadleaf evergreens that work well in our climate. So you're gonna see Euonymus for sale in virtually every single big box store and garden center, 
But instead of euonymus, think about Panchito manzanita instead. It's a beautiful um, shrubby plant. It, this is a summer shot of it, but it looks like this throughout the year. So even in the winter, you're getting this green look in your landscape. It does really well on uh, rock walls and slopes because it starts to drape and kind of fill in those areas. It's just fantastic. Now it can be a little hit or miss to get these established, but um, if you can get one to grow, it can last you for years. So certainly check this out. They're about um, maybe a foot tall and can get to be about four to five feet wide at maturity. Another quality that I'm looking for in plants is a long bloom time. <clears throat> so what I wanna point out in this part of our WaterWise demonstration garden is that this particular mini landscape, we have irises that bloom in the spring, we have lilacs that bloom in the spring, we have other plants like this lavender that are blooming in the summer. But this red flowered plant right here is called red valerian, and that's the one I wanna talk about. This particular plant is a, a perennial flower, and it has these clusters of reddish pink flowers in June that will persist all the way through to September, especially if you remove the faded flowers. This is just a, one of those few plants that will flower for a really long time. Now, in this landscape, you see we've got it right by the front of our um, fictional front door, <laughs> but I like this because in a real landscape, that's exactly where you want to site it because this is the plant that every time you come home from work or you have guests coming up to your house, they're going to see this plant that has all these gorgeous flowers. Um, just a close-up of the flowers um, where you can see there really are these nice clusters of little flowers that are just beautiful. Another plant that has the same characteristic is called Engelman daisy. Now this is a native plant um, that grows on the front range of Colorado and it too will bloom for a long period of time from June to August. And so um, because it's native to Colorado, it's very well adapted to our climate and has beautiful green leaves. So one could even think about pairing Engelman daisy with red valerian um, and coming up with a great combination where you've got this reddish pink flower with a yellow flower through much of the summer. Um, especially as our landscapes get smaller, it's important for all of us to think about how we can get the most bang for our buck from all the plants that we have. And that's a good one to think about. This is an example um, from our WaterWise demonstration garden where we have um, Engelman daisy planted by the entrance and we have Mexican feather grass right next to it. And just imagine if you had a red valerian in there as well, that would be a gorgeous combination. All right, another um, quality that I'm looking for in plants is a beautiful shape. So I'm looking for plants that, whether they have flowers on them or not, have a nice pleasing shape. This is a great example right here where we've got um, false indigo, which is actually a flowering perennial plant, but it has um, a very uniform size and shape of about three to four feet tall and wide. Here in this landscape, we have it paired with Periscry Squitchgrass and then Orange Carpet Hummingbird Trumpet. So that's a really nice plant. But what I love about this plant is that because it's a flowering perennial, in May and into early June, it has these spikes of deep blue large flowers. And then when it's out of bloom, it looks really great. And then in the fall, all of those um, leaves turn into like the color of like an aspen tree. It's really gorgeous. And then all of those flowers will turn into these black seed pods that are really attractive. The nice thing about this plant is that in the spring, all you have to do is cut it back to the ground and then it'll regrow from um, the base back up to that three to four feet in height and width. So it's almost like the size of a shrub but because it's a perennial, you don't get a lot of dead branches showing up because you're cutting it back every spring. So certainly a plant that I would recommend. Another thing in Colorado is we need to choose plants that have winter interest because um, much of our year is when plants are not actively growing. So from like November all the way through April, 
uh, you know, if we only have things that look good during the summer, we're going to be losing a lot of our aesthetic qualities in our landscape through that six month brown period. So in order to create a landscape that looks good in the winter, make sure that you include evergreens and those could be evergreen trees or they could also be dwarf evergreens. In this particular example, we have this beautiful dwarf spruce right here. And then we also have this particular plant called hillside creeper pine. And this particular hillside creeper pine can cover like six to 10 uh, square feet. So it can be a really good addition if you want to have an evergreen shrub that is gonna cover some space and not be a juniper. Um, and then if you couple some boulders and some ornamental grasses in a combination with some evergreens, you can really get a nice looking landscape that will look beautiful in the fall all the way through to spring. So evergreens, boulders, and ornamental grasses, those are key. And oftentimes when we're buying plants at the nursery, we, we just wanna buy things that have all these beautiful flowers. But don't forget about these supporting actors because they're the ones that are gonna be holding down the fort and making your landscape look great all the way through the winter. All right, so what ornamental grasses do we recommend? Well, I would certainly check out that plant list that I posted in the chat. But one of my favorites is called Little Blue Stem. Now this is an ornamental grass that will grow to be about two to four feet tall and one to two feet wide. And it has beautiful kind of bluish green leaves in the summer. But in the winter and the fall, the leaves turn a really brilliant red. And this is nice because many of our plants will turn sort of a blonde color or a brown color. But because little blue stem turns red, um, it really highlights and give you this, gives you this different color in the landscape in the winter. Uh, what I find is that many people who come from areas where the leaves of the trees turn red feel like they're missing something in Colorado because that's kind of rare amongst our tree species. But if you can work these reds into the leaves within your shrubs and also in your ornamental grasses, it can give you a sense of having a difference, different tones of color in the fall and winter. So little bluesome is a great one to think about. Um, another really fantastic ornamental grass is Blonde Ambition Blue Grandma. Now, unlike Little Blue Stem, this one turns a very bright blonde in the fall and winter, so it's, it's gorgeous. It's mostly throughout the year, it's kind of a clump of green grass, but then in August, it puts up these beautiful eyelash-like seed heads um, above this light blue-green leaves. Um, the thing that's really great about this particular plant is it is super adaptable. It has been planted in medians in the Colorado Springs area, um, in hot, dry conditions, um, lots of different places it does really well. Um, it gets to be about a three by three mound, um, but it's fantastic. Here are two landscape combinations that you might wanna consider. So in this particular one on the left-hand side, we have Blonde Ambition Blue Grandpa with um, the Hummingbird Mint that I spoke about earlier. Um, with a tall blue rabbit brush in the back. So super simple combination where you could just have the rabbit brush as a shrub that gives you the silvery leaves, the hummingbird mint, which is gonna give you the orange flowers, and then the blonde ambition blue grandma. On the right hand side, instead we have a blue salvia, we have the blonde ambition blue grandma, and then a Russian sage as well. So you can see how it's just a wonderful plant that is a perfect filler. Another quality of plants that I like to look for is something that's gonna feed birds. Um, this is a plant at our demonstration garden called Windwalker Royal Red Salvia, and I'll post the, um, the name on the next slide. But what I wanna show you is how covered this plant is with these spikes of red flowers. This plant is a hummingbird magnet, and it's just a fantastic looking landscape plant as well. It starts blooming like maybe in July and then continues all the way into October. So when hummingbirds are migrating through the Colorado Springs area, they are just really, really attracted to it. You can see how it's got these great, beautiful spikes of flowers that just bloom up the stalk. And if a stalk gets finished, you can just pinch it off um, and then it will keep blooming. Um, and I would certainly say that we have found that it can get pretty tall. 
So one thing we've started doing is when it gets to be about 12 inches tall in the spring, we just pinch it back about six inches. And that makes it a little bit more shrubby and a little bit more able to support all those um, spikes of red flowers, but certainly something to consider for your own landscape. All right, another thing you wanna do is make sure if you've got a large area, um, one thing you can consider is using spreading plants that take up a lot of space. Now in this particular example, we have, I wanted to highlight this plant called the Grow Low Sumac, which is kind of this shrubby plant down here with glossy green leaves that um, you can see is taking up a lot of the ground plain. I like this plant because rather than having to cover all of the ground with turf grass that you have to irrigate, you can start taking up some of the space with plants like Grow Low Sumac or maybe Pawnee Butte Sand Cherry. There's a couple of other different examples of spreading shrubs that can help you figure out how to cover the ground so you're not getting a lot of weeds invading and you're not having to put rock everywhere. These spreading plants can really be a great option for a landscape. Now in this particular landscape, these smaller trees are called hawthorns, which are fantastic small trees, um, work really well in the Pikes Peak region. But I wanted to show you what this Grolo sumac looks like in the fall. Oh, before I do that, I wanted to just say that it's about 24 inches tall and it really does have these glossy green leaves throughout the summer. And then in the fall, those turn a really nice bright red. You can see that the hawthorn has already started to lose its leaves. Um, the ornamental grass has started to turn brown and the turf grass is still green. But what a beautiful contrast with that Grow Low Sumac to give you that extra pop of color. It doesn't really have um, much flower. Um, it doesn't really have a lot of flowers that are eye catching, but the fall color is a really nice addition. Okay, and then fragrance. Fragrance is one of those things that I think sometimes we want to have in our landscapes, we just don't know how to work it in. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about chocolate flower, but this is a landscape in Colorado Springs that has some really nice um, elements right in front of this rock wall. So you have the chocolate flower, which is the one with the yellow flowers. Um, in addition, you have the lead plant, which we've already talked about. There's also another little perennial down here called Cranesville or perennial geranium that will have really bright magenta flowers that kind of in a mounding shape. And then the dwarf yugo pine, which tends to do pretty well um, in Colorado Springs and could be a great evergreen to consider. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about chocolate flower. So chocolate flower is a native perennial flower that um, grows in the Southwestern US. Um, what's nice about this particular plant is that it, the flowers open in the morning. And if you go out in the morning, they really do have the scent of chocolate. So you can get um, a really, really, really nice uh, fragrance coming up from your landscape when this plant is in bloom. It does bloom for quite a while um, and it will seed around in your landscape and fill in any gaps that you might have. Okay, another tip um, when you're putting your plant combinations together is to think about contrasting the textures of your plants. Because many times our plants are not in bloom and how do you make your landscape look good even when you, those, there's no flowers? Well, the trick there is to think about planting large leafed plants next to plants with small leaves. Now we talked about the benefits of having small leaves when we have hailstorms or windstorms. And so in this particular landscape, we have common juniper that has really tiny needles. And then we've got little leaf mountain mahogany, which is just a, a wonderful, very xeric shrub. But the thing that looks so beautiful in this landscape is the banana yucca, which has got those curly um, fibers coming off the edges and this really architectural form. But part of the reason why it looks so good is because it's got this backdrop of these tiny leaved plants. So the more that you can kind of contrast the size of the leaves, um, you can really start to make your landscape look nice, even if it might not be in bloom. Here's another example. I think this is my last landscape photo. 
um, but I wanted to show you how they did the same type of strategy with ornamental grasses and a yucca. So in this case, they have the Blonde Ambition Blue Grandma Grass in the background. You can see how that really creates a highlight with that blonde color. And they have a beautiful yucca up front. But um, this plant on the left that has this cloud-like uh, mass of seed heads is called Undaunted Ruby Muley Grass. It has been a great performer here in the Colorado Springs area. It greens up early and through much of the um, the season it's kind of a just a nice mound of green leaves but then starting in august it produces these clouds of pink seed heads which just make the whole entire area look like it's just a, a really feathery sphere of beautiful plant material um, so very low maintenance you just cut it back to ground level in the spring and so you can see that by mixing together these different textures how you can get a very low maintenance low water Colorado-like landscape that just looks gorgeous. So with that, I want to um, just give you a few closing points and then see if there's anybody who has any questions that they'd like to have answered. So the main thing I wanted to just communicate to you today is to select plants wisely before you make a big investment. That's such a key to making your landscape look great in the long term. And as I mentioned, we have a wide variety of resources to help you make those decisions. So take advantage of those and um, we can certainly help you out if you need help in that area. Now, uh, I would recommend for you to shop from local sources first, uh, but if you need to, you can certainly widen your horizons and find plants from the places where they're available. And if you're from another area and this is there's a, just a new plant palette here, I would certainly recommend learning to enjoy the process of discovering native plants and working with our local climate and water resources. Because even though this might not be the best place to grow hydrangeas, we have so many other plants that can really enhance our lifestyle and our properties and make our homes and businesses great places in the Pikes Peak region. Have a wonderful evening and once again, enjoy the planting season and summertime. We hope you have a great gardening year this year. Thank you.